The first speaker who really organized today's event is our associate director, uh, that is uh, Dr. Fiona Crawford, and uh, she's going to talk about some very, very new studies that for the, you'll be the people to hear for the very first time. Dr. Crawford? Hello. I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. It is a real pleasure to invite you here to share with you some of what's going on here at the Ross Kemp Institute, both in terms of our laboratory research and our clinical research. I know that a lot of folks have no idea what goes on here. If they've heard of us at all, they maybe know that we have a clinic. Uh, they certainly don't know some of the outstanding research that's going on in the labs. And my role today is to talk to you a little bit about what I'm terming translational research because everything that we do at the Ross Camp Institute is about advancing treatments and getting better diagnostic approaches for any of the conditions that we are investigating. And so I'm going to start off by talking about our Alzheimer program because we've been working on that for the longest period of time and it has now advanced to a very exciting stage of its development. But it's of relevance to, to all of us of course, it's of extreme relevance to an aging population and it's of extreme relevance to the military and our veterans and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other militarily relevant conditions that we're investigating here at the Institute. Those programs are in their earlier stages but in my mind they're going to follow right down the same path that our Alzheimer's research has and thanks to new technology and new advances and the additional expertise that we all have now here at the Institute I'm very confident that we will be moving forward with better diagnosis and better treatments in those conditions in a shorter time frame. After my presentation, we're going to hear from Dr. Mike Hoffman and Dr. Andy Keegan, who will tell you more about the clinical activities here and what we're, what we're doing for, for patients and caregivers and families here in the community. And then you'll all be able to go on a, a tour of the Institute or stick around, ask more questions. We'll be, we'll be available to you. So I am going to try and give you about 20 years of research in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> um, I would also like to invite you, if there's anything that is not clear, whether scientifically or Irish accent, as I'm going through, please interrupt, stick your hand up and ask. I would rather clear that up as I go along than reach the end and find that uh, nobody understood what I said when I said amyloid, because that would be pretty key. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take that time to bring you up to speed and, um, and I think it's very exciting. As I said, I'm going to start off with our Alzheimer's research. So as unfortunately pretty much everyone is aware these days, Alzheimer's is a pretty devastating neurodegenerative disease and this is what Alzheimer's looks like in the brains of a, a patient at autopsy. What you're looking at here are so-called neurofibrillary tangles. These are deposits of a protein called tau, a buildup of protein called tau in the neurons, in the actual brain cells. And what happens whenever this protein uh, builds up and sticks together and has abnormal modifications happen to the protein, we get what are called neurofibrillary tangles. And neurofibrillary tangles are not only a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, they're also a hallmark of traumatic brain injury, and I will come back to that later. This is the other key pathological feature of Alzheimer's disease, the so-called amyloid plaque or senile plaque. Amyloid is a small protein that we all make all the time. It's got some normal role in, in our development and our function because it's been highly conserved throughout evolution. We all make it normally, so it does something normally. And research that we've carried out here at the Institute suggests that it may have a role in blood vessel maintenance. But whenever we get older, 
or if we have mutations that cause early onset Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that happens is that instead of amyloid moving out of the brain after it's done its job, it builds up. And as amyloid starts to build up in the brain, it starts to become insoluble. And so it starts to come out of solution and form these plaques. This is an amyloid plaque, which is, is uh, an extracellular deposit of this protein. Now, amyloid is pretty central to everything I'm going to talk about in the Alzheimer part of, of my presentation today, because that's what we have really focused on at the Roskamp Institute. Uh, Dr. Mullen, the director of the Institute, he and I were part of the team in London that 20 years ago identified the first genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease. And those genetic causes were mutations in the amyloid gene. Now, I'll just for the sake of the, the non-scientists in the audience, I'll just very quickly tell you that our genes encode a message that results in the proteins that our bodies are comprised of. So when you get a genetic error at the DNA level, then that can result in a change at the protein level. And that, that molecular level of analysis is fundamental to everything that we do here at the Roskamp Institute. This schematic is probably a little bit difficult to see, I, I apologize for that, but the pink here represents the full-length amyloid precursor protein. And this piece here is the amyloid protein that is cut out of that larger piece. And this is the piece that causes the problems in Alzheimer's disease. And I won't go into all the details here, but suffice to say there are several different ways that this larger protein can be cut up. One of the ways means you don't get amyloid being formed at all. But if you go to the right here, this direction, you get amyloid being produced. And the mutations that we found and that other people have subsequently found that cause early onset Alzheimer's disease all result in an increase in production of amyloid. So if you, if you picture, just to make a mental picture of that, the one I like to, to use is if you think of adding sugar to a glass of water. When you first start adding sugar into a glass of water, it goes into solution and you don't see it anymore. But if you keep on heaping the sugar in, it starts to settle out on the bottom. And that's, that's how you can picture what happens with amyloid in the brain. As too much of it starts to be produced and not enough of it is getting cleared out of the brain, then it starts to come out of solution and stick together. And that's when we see those amyloid plaques. Now this, I just always have to show this picture. Uh, and I apologize for those of you not familiar with what DNA sequencing looked like 20 years ago. But this I have to show. This is the so-called Swedish mutation. This is a mutation that we found that causes early onset Alzheimer's disease. It is very rare, like all of the early onset mutations, but it causes Alzheimer's disease with 100% certainty. So what I'm showing you here you don't need to know the details of DNA sequencing. You can just look at the pattern on the left, which is a healthy individual, and the pattern on the right, which is his brother with Alzheimer's disease. And if you just compare the two patterns, you can see that there's a difference right here. This individual has just two bands. This individual has four at this point. Can everybody see that clearly enough? What we're looking at here is the fact that we're looking at chromosome 21, a specific part of the chromosome 21 DNA sequence. It's actually a part of the amyloid gene sequence. And this particular point on that DNA sequence, in the individual with Alzheimer's disease, one of his chromosomes has the normal sequence, but one has the abnormal sequence. This is just two spelling mistakes out of about three and a half billion letters in the genetic code. And this causes Alzheimer's disease with 100% certainty. Now, the significance of finding mutations like this is that it really focused us on amyloid as a central cause to Alzheimer's disease. When we introduced this mutation into cells in the laboratory, what we discovered was that this mutation causes amyloid to be produced at about six or eight times the amount it normally is. So you imagine you've, if you've had this mutation from birth, that's why you get early onset Alzheimer's disease because you've been building up extra amounts of amyloid all that time. Whereas in the more common form of Alzheimer's disease, folks start to build up amyloid in the brain 
once our systems start to wind down, once those mechanisms that, that pull amyloid out of the brain start to, start to wind down, that's when it starts to build up. One of the key things that happened when the mutations were identified was that we were able to now model Alzheimer's disease in animals. And so we used transgenics, transgenic approaches, which allow you to introduce human genetic material into a mouse. And so what we have is a mouse that has his entire normal genetic code, and then he also has a piece of, of human DNA as well. And that mouse has the Swedish mutation, that human sequence of, of the amyloid gene. And those mice are born normally and they develop normally, but as they get older, they start to develop amyloid plaques in the brain. This on the right is a transgenic mouse. This is a human Alzheimer patient. And the, uh, the stain that we're using here to detect the amyloid plaque is COX-2. It's a, an inflammatory marker. So you can see that when we look at inflammation around the amyloid plaque in the human and in the mouse, it's very, very similar. And we see other things with these mice too. They don't, they don't get all of the features of human Alzheimer's disease but they do exhibit memory problems and learning problems as they get older. So once you have an animal model, that means you can now start to really test your theories about what's causing the disease and how you can stop it. So developing these transgenic mice really revolutionized the Alzheimer research field. And here's an example, there he is, a very reproducible experiment. Put a male mouse and a female mouse together and you end up with a few thousand in a very short space of time and, uh, and you'll, you'll see our, uh, our animal facilities as you walk around today. This is a mouse performing one of those memory tasks I mentioned. This is the so-called Morris water maze and I'll mention that now because I'm going to come back to it later. What we do is we have a, a kid-sized paddling pool and it's filled with water and there's a platform below the surface of the water and mice don't like to swim. And so when you put them in the water, they'll swim around and when they find the platform, they'll climb out. And so we have markers like this on the side of the pool. And healthy mice will learn over time that the platform is next to that marker. So when you put them into the pool, they will swim straight there and they'll climb out in the platform. But the mice that have Alzheimer's disease will not learn. They may still find the platform by chance, but there will be no evident learning and they, they, they won't remember one day to the next that the platform was next to that marker. So a number of ways <clears throat> to, to approach the, the amyloid hypothesis in Alzheimer's disease. And again, this is just another representation. Here's a, here's a sink and here's a faucet with, with amyloid being produced. So this represents amyloid being produced in the brain and it builds up here and it somehow has an effect, a deleterious effect, on the brain cells, the neurons. And then it, it should get cleared out of the brain. So if you, if you imagine this as a, a sort of scenario for Alzheimer's disease, as we get too much amyloid here, we get damage to the neurons, and there's not enough clearance here. So there's three possible ways to, to tackle this. We could try and turn off the faucet or turn it down so that there's less amyloid being produced. We can try and work out what it is that amyloid does that damages the neurons so much, or we can try and increase the clearance out of the brain. And all three of those have been mechanisms that we and many pharmaceutical companies have used. Most, uh, most favoured have been approaches using inhibitors of enzymes to try and block the production of amyloid. I am not going to go into a lot of detail here in this presentation. I will be happy to go into a lot more detail with anybody who's interested. But suffice to say that in our labs, we have screened tens of thousands of compounds to see whether or not they will affect amyloid production. And one of the ways we do that is we have cells that are genetically engineered to produce large amounts of amyloid. And that means that when we treat them with these different compounds, it's easy for us to see when we have an effect on amyloid production. Back in Dr. Paris's lab, where you'll go later, you'll see the, the setup where we screen thousands and thousands of drugs. And we can also do this on the computer. We can use what's called in silico modeling. And Dr. Mathura will show you how we use computer modeling to actually be able 
to screen compounds virtually. And as you can imagine, that's, that's great. It means we can get through thousands of compounds on the computer, identify the ones that we think are important, and then we can test them in the cells and test them in the mice. And then the, the further step of the process, once we find a compound that looks as if it works in the cells and looks as if it works in the mice, we can then go to our chemists and say, OK, this is a compound that worked really well. Can you make me another 20 that look like this? And we'll see if we've got one that works even better or maybe has less side effects or has a better profile. And so we have all of that going on here at the Institute. We, we can take it right from start through to finish. We can actually make drugs here to FDA standards. And as I say, I'll be happy to talk more about any of the details of that. But right now, I'm going to focus on this compound. This is nilvadapine. Nilvadapine, for any of the chemists in the audience, it's a dihydropyridine, which is a, a well-known class of chemical compounds. Now, nilvadapine is actually a drug that has been available in Europe and in Japan for about 20 years. It's an antihypertensive. And what we found in our laboratory experiments was that amyloid blo um, nilvadapine blocked amyloid production at a, at a very potent level in our experiments. Now, the significance of nilvadapine, although we have many other drugs that actually look more potent than, than nilvadapine, nilvadapine's already been in patients. It's got a 20-year history of being used in human beings. It's a very, very safe drug, and we have all of this toxicology and clinical safety data. That means we can move forward much faster with looking at nilvadapine in, in human Alzheimer patients than we can with some of the other drugs in our pipeline that are potentially more, uh, more efficacious. We're still working on those drugs, but they will, they will take longer to move forward with. So we investigated nilvadapine in our Alzheimer mice to see its effect on blood flow. This picture is a scanning laser Doppler of the mouse brain, and this is what the Alzheimer mice look like. The red indicates how much blood flow there is, and so the more blood flow, the more red and the better. The, we want good blood flow in the brain. And as you probably know, in human Alzheimer patients, one of the things that happens is there is reduced cerebral blood flow as the disease progresses. Both panels, both sides here, are Alzheimer mice, but the mice on the right have been treated with nilvadapine for 10 months. And you can see how much more red there is, how much more blood flow there is in the mice that were treated with the drug versus the placebo. Now we look at the pathology. This is in the brains of the Alzheimer mice that did not receive treatment. All of these dots and marks here, this is amyloid deposits in the brains of the transgenic mice. This is the amyloid in the brains of the mice that received 10 months of treatment with nilvadapine. And actually these mice were treated beginning at 10 months of age. And at that age, the mice already have a small amount of amyloid deposits in the brain. So we think that's what we're seeing here and that actually this was the 10-month amyloid burden in the brain and it didn't progress past that once we started treatment with nilvadapine. Another very interesting aspect of this drug, when we look in the blood of the mice in a short treatment, just a four-day treatment, we see that the level of amyloid in the blood of the treated mice is much higher than in the untreated mice. And this suggests to us that not only is the drug reducing amyloid production in the brain, it's also increasing the clearance out of the brain. So it's hitting both of those pathways that I talked about. So this is very exciting. And this, I, I will show this. I'm, I'm always very hesitant about showing anything specific to do with mice for all the, the reasons. You know, folks have concerns about animal studies. But in the absence of animal models, we're testing these drugs on humans. That's the way I look at it. And so if we have good animal models for disease, we should be employing them. This is a schematic to show you what the Morris water maze looks like from above. We have a camera system that tracks what the mice do. So this represents the platform here in the north uh, east quadrant. And the red is the path of a mouse. He was introduced here and swam all the way around. And I don't even think he found the platform in this plot. He ends up over here somewhere. But by nine days of testing, you put him in the pool, he goes straight to the platform. And if you look at the bottom panels, 
This is an Alzheimer mouse. He swims all around. I'm sorry if you can't see that down there, but he's swimming all around. And by nine days, he does eventually find the platform, but it's nothing compared to what happened with the control mouse. I'm showing that to you now because I think that as soon as I advance to the next slide, things are going to start moving. So what you're going to see on the next slide is a, um, I think the normal mouse is on the left-hand side, uh, the untreated mouse, and the treated mouse is on the right-hand side. It may be the other way around. It's going to be obvious. Here we go. You can see the mouse being put into the pool here. Oh, here we go. So the mouse treated with novadipine has already found the platform. The mouse on the left is still going. So this is a, a representation of what it looks like when we treat the mice with novadipine, the Alzheimer mice, and test them in the Morris water maze. And this test is, is a very well established test in Alzheimer's research for learning and memory in mice. Everybody always asks, how can you tell if a mouse has Alzheimer's disease? Well, you can tell if it's got memory problems and cognitive dysfunction. So, in summary from the lab research, nilvadipine, this drug that we know is very safe, uh, has been used for 20 years, in our laboratory models, increased blood flow in the Alzheimer mice, reduced amyloid production, reduced amyloid burden in the brains of the Alzheimer mice, uh, seem to increase the clearance of amyloid out of the brain and improve their learning and memory. So, of course, the next step was to see what will this drug do in humans. Now, I mentioned this study. There are a number of studies, totally independent of our research here, that suggest that nilvadipine might be useful in Alzheimer's disease. There was a, a big study on hypertension, the so-called Cysture study, that was done several years ago using a compound that's not dissimilar to nilvadipine, another dihydropyridine. It was actually a study of, of hypertension, but when they, when they looked at the population at the end of the study, they found that the folks that had been taking that drug that, that was similar to nilvadipine actually had a reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease compared to the folk who were on other drugs. So that's some suggestive supporting data. This study is one that I think is very interesting. It's a very small study conducted by a Japanese group. And they were looking at individuals with mild cognitive impairment, which is the, the prelude to Alzheimer's disease. And they were looking at the effects of nilvadipine and amlodipine, another antihypertensive drug. I believe amlodipine is the correct name for Norvasc, which is available here. And they followed their patients over a period of up to 20 months. Now, what you're looking at here is something called the ADAS-COG. It's an Alzheimer's disease scale that is used to measure decline in Alzheimer patients. And the higher the number you get, the worse you're doing. So basically, the folks that move up here over time are doing worse. These are the individuals who are being treated with amlodipine. And you can see that the, the general path, the average of the path, is shown in yellow. And so the general path in this study was for folks to decline. And every person marked with an asterisk here actually converted from a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease during the course of this study. Again, very small numbers. I think there's just seven uh, in, this, in this group. In the nilvadipine group, quite a difference. If you look at the average path, it's much flatter. It's plateauing, so folks were actually stabilizing over time. And if you look at the number that converted to Alzheimer's disease, it was just one person out of eight in this group. So again, a very small study, but an independent study from ours. And again, very suggestive that nilvadipine might be useful in Alzheimer's disease. It's a big issue, translating from mouse to human. There have been many, many situations in Alzheimer's and, and other conditions where something has worked well in laboratory models and that has not translated to the human uh, implementation. So we conducted a small study in Ireland. We have collaborators there, friends and family there. And, and you know, the Irish are nice to work with, right? <laughs> We've got some friends there. Um, it's available in Ireland as an antihypertensive. That's the key thing. So it meant that we could move forward with a study with the primary goal of checking the safety 
it's very important. We had to know, is nilvadipine safe to give to Alzheimer patients? It's an antihypertensive, and frequently folks with Alzheimer's disease, as they progress, start to exhibit lowering of, lowering of their blood pressure. So you need to be really careful. If you're giving somebody who's already got low blood pressure, you're giving them an antihypertensive. So we paid particular attention to blood pressure in this study. It was a small study. These studies are extremely expensive to conduct. So we had 86 Alzheimer patients, and it was just a six-week study. It was not placebo-controlled. It was just treated or untreated. So it was what's called open label. The people and, and the families knew whether the individuals were getting nilvadipine or not. And as I mentioned, the main outcome measure was safety, but we also looked at memory, just at that six-week time point, very, very short study, but would, would potentially give you enough information to say, do we want to go further? And what we found in this study was firstly that it was very safe. We had no uh, related adverse events. Anything that happened to any of the patients during the course of the study, none of it was deemed to be related to them taking um, nilvadipine. Moreover, we found that there were minimal effects on blood pressure. The folks who already had a, a high blood pressure, it lowered their blood pressure a bit. The folks who had normal blood pressure or low blood pressure, it didn't have any effect on them. So that was very good. And then most exciting, is that we did actually see some improvement on some of the measures of cognitive function. And again, I will stress, this was just a six-week study. Most Alzheimer trials run for 18 months because you have to be able to see the decline in the placebo group, and you need 18 months to really see that clearly. But nonetheless, this was very encouraging and led us to want to push forward with nilvadipine. So I'm very pleased to announce that we're actually moving forward now with nilvadipine in a phase three study in Europe. It's going to be 500 Alzheimer patients. It's going to be placebo controlled, 18 months, everything that you need, all the appropriate measures, all the typical things of an Alzheimer study. And this is actually going to be starting in 2012. Very excited about this. Thank you. And I can tell you, I just came back from the uh, clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease meeting in California and um, Brian Lawler from Dublin who is the lead investigator on this study. It's, it's involving sites throughout Europe, uh, Ireland, UK, Greece, Germany, France, uh, a really a truly multi-centre effort. And it was, it was the only new drug that I heard being talked about. A lot of the talk was about how to design the clinical trials as we go forward. Uh, how to t kind of try and tweak things to make sure that we maximize our ability to see an effect. But uh, I'm really optimistic about what we're going to see with nilvadipine. Of course, it's, it's going to be a few years before we know what's happening. But I'm just delighted that we've now managed to take our research from the point of those genetic discoveries 20 years ago to now what we planned, what we wanted, what we intended to be doing all along, getting a new drug into the clinic for Alzheimer patients. So I'm very excited. There's very few drugs in trial right now that are focused at amyloid, and, uh, and we've got one of them. So that's great. We have, as I mentioned, other compounds in the pipeline. All the work going on back here, there's still plenty of work going on with other drugs because we will want to have better drugs to move forward with. Uh, one of the compounds is called ARC31. And I mention that because it's related to nilvadipine. And so it may possibly be able to be advanced into the clinic, again, a little bit quicker than the typical process because it's related to a drug that has already been in humans. And I mention that because I'm going to come back to that when I talk about our traumatic brain injury research. So now I'm going to just wrap up with a, with a few more slides telling you about our traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and Gulf War illness research which really I think is, is very, very important. It's something that I have a real passion for working on and delivering on uh, to our military and to our, our veterans. Um, starting at the bottom here, I'll mention Gulf War illness. Gulf War illness um, relates to the 1991 conflict. And as I'm sure many of you know, 
when the soldiers started coming back from that conflict and started complaining of neurological signs and symptoms, they were up against a lot of, a lot of controversy. Um, was this a real condition? Was it a real disease? I don't need to tell you guys. I have been at the Gulf War Research Advisory Committees at the VA in Washington. There are GWI patients there. It is a real condition. There is absolutely no question about it. It is an extremely heterogeneous condition. The presentation can be cognitive dysfunction. It can be chronic pain, fibromyalgia, um, multi-symptom multi illness. Uh, but it's very definitely real. And when I, when I speak to non-military uh, related uh, groups of folks, sometimes, you know, there's, there's an attitude of, well, you know, we're talking about 200,000 patients. You know, this, this was a single event, you know, a one month situation. Why is this relevant? It's relevant because we now know, quite, quite aside from being relevant for those 200,000 troops, it's also relevant today because we now know that Gulf War illness is the result of pesticide poisoning, essentially. The combination of insecticides and pesticides and treatment with pyridostigmine bromide as a prophylactic, these are now known to be the cause of this very, very broad, diverse condition that is known as Gulf War illness. Now, we've been working on Gulf War illness for many years now here at the Institute. And just as with the Alzheimer work, the, the Alzheimer work is, is like a road map now for us. Our Alzheimer work, we identified a cause, we developed models, we treated, we developed new treatments, we kept tweaking and exploring the biology, and now we're moving forward into the clinic. And so it can be with all the other conditions that we look at. So with Gulf War illness, we are developing and have developed laboratory models. And from those laboratory models, we're able to work out what's actually going on in the brains of those animals, what's actually going on at the cellular level. And we can work out what's different in an exposure situation. If you're exposed to pyridostigmine bromide and an insecticide versus non-exposed, what are the molecular pathways that are getting switched on? And how do we switch them off? And so we have, we have work going on on Gulf War illness. We are initiating a program on post-traumatic stress disorder, the similar, similar plan, develop models and work out at the molecular level what is going on. And then the traumatic brain injury research I'm going to focus on now because we've done most in this area. Traumatic brain injury, um, as, as you all know, I'll just go down a little bit. The, these are some of, the, some of the consequences of traumatic brain injury. It is a very big deal these days. Finally, people are recognizing that traumatic brain injury is a, a, a very significant uh, factor, not just in our military populations, but in our civilian populations. Um, one of the things that's happened is that because of all the improved body armor that our troops now have, they're more susceptible to, to surviving with a brain injury. The other thing, of course, is the, is the new technology of warfare, the IEDs, the blast injury. It's, a, it's the signature injury of this war is traumatic brain injury. And it's now very clear that we're not just talking about severe traumatic brain injury, so-called mild traumatic brain injury, where folks maybe don't even know that they've sustained an injury. They may have been in the vicinity of a pressure wave. And of course, if they're not aware that they have sustained an injury, they're still out there in the field. It's boots on the ground. So they are out there getting exposed over and over again. And we now know that repetitive mild injury is extremely detrimental. And the long-term consequences of head injury, they evolve over time. So one of the things I know, we, we have, uh, I have a position at the VA in Tampa, and some of the neuropsychologists that I work with there tell me that they will be meeting with a patient and talking with them because of some other injury, maybe you know some limb wounds or amputations or something like that. And over the course of the evaluation, it becomes evident that that individual has actually sustained traumatic brain injury. And so these consequences evolve over time. And we started working uh, on, Alza on uh, TBI partly because of the relationship with Alzheimer's disease. 
Traumatic brain injury is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. If you've had a traumatic brain injury in your life, even if it was 50 years ago, it increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. We also know that at the pathological level, some of what we see in the brains of traumatically brain injured individuals looks like what we see in the brains of Alzheimer's individuals. We see amyloid deposits, we see neurofibrillary tangles. And the other that I, I will just mention, the APOE gene, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. This is a gene that we all carry, one copy from each parent, and there's three common forms of it. And the E4 form, if you have one or two copies of the E4 form of this gene, you are at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, and you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease in your late 60s and early 70s, as opposed to somebody who has two copies of the E3 form, who's more likely to get it in their 80s. And we don't know yet, we're doing work here, we don't know yet exactly how this gene confers risk for Alzheimer's disease. But the other thing we do know, and I did a study with the VA population 10 years ago, is that APOE also confers risk of a poor outcome after traumatic brain injury. We looked at a population of veterans patients who had sustained traumatic brain injury and we matched them for their level of brain injury and we matched them on demographics, their gender, their race, their age. And we looked at them six months after they had sustained injury. And what we found was that the individuals who had one or two copies of the E4 form of APOE were doing worse on measures of cognitive function and executive function. And if you model this in mice, if you take mice that express the different forms of APOE. The E4 mice do worse than the E3 mice. If you give them the same level of injury, the E4 mice do worse. So this is a way to hone things in the lab. We know that there's this genetic risk factor that influences our outcome after head injury. And so what we've done in our traumatic brain injury studies here is that we've taken mice that are genetically predisposed to either a, a favorable outcome or an unfavorable outcome. And we can compare the responses. And by doing that, we can try and get at the molecular level to what the good responses are to a brain injury, the ones that will help in repair the neurons, versus the bad ones, the ones that lead to neurodegeneration. Now, in those studies, we've been applying something called proteomics. And I am definitely not going to try and explain proteomics to you in much detail. You will see some of the technology when, when you walk around today. But I will just say that since the completion of the Human Genome Project, we now know all of the genes in, in the human genome. And that enables us to know and to predict all of the proteins that can be produced. And because, because we know that, we can now take pieces of proteins and identify them using mass spectrometry. We can identify pieces of proteins with a very, very high level of accuracy. Why is that important? Well, unlike our work with Alzheimer's disease, where we had the genetic errors which pointed us to amyloid, if we're looking at conditions such as traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder or Gulf War illness, these are environmental exposures. There's genetic influences on them for sure, but if you never actually got exposed, these conditions would not emerge. And we really don't know what the starting point is. We don't know where to begin if we're trying to look at the brain and say, what actually was the initiating factor here? It's not like having a genetic error that we can focus on and say, OK, it's amyloid. If a brain has sustained a blast injury, all of the tissue has been involved. There's a physical injury as well as the secondary injury at the molecular level. Proteomics is one of the ways to try and address that because proteomics allows us to take a very complex sample like brain tissue and we can take that from a head injured situation and from a non-head injured situation and we can actually identify and quantify all of the proteins that are present. And so we can say that in the head injured brain, different proteins were showing up and they were showing up at different levels. So we can actually work out what happens at the molecular level. That's all I'll say about proteomics. In essence, we're able to work out molecular pathways that are triggered in response to injury. And that will lead us to 
therapeutic targets and also if we are comparing blood samples from individuals with and without head injury, with and without post-traumatic stress disorder, we think that we may be able to identify so-called biomarkers in the blood, proteins that are changing in the blood because this individual has sustained a traumatic brain injury. This is a very important issue. As I mentioned, a lot of these folks go undiagnosed. We need something in the field at the actual point of care out there, you know, at the forward operating bases, we need something to be able to assess our military when they've been in the vicinity of a blast. So you can tell right away, can this guy go out again or should we, should we be sending him to launch deal? You know, we need to know. So that said, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our work with ARC-31. ARC-31 is the nilvadipine related molecule. And I've looked at that in our mouse models of head injury. And the reason I looked at it in our mice models of head injury is because when we did this proteomic analysis of the brain in the head injured mice, and when we compared the APOE3 mice with the APOE4 mice to try and identify the pathways that may be pointed towards repair or degeneration, some of the molecular pathways that came up were pathways involving inflammation and pathways involving amyloid production and amyloid metabolism. And we know that nilvadipine targets both of those pathways, and so does the nilvadipine derivative. And very briefly, this is a summary of the Morris Water Maze data from mice that received head injury. They all received head injury. The ones in the, the light color, the lavender here, received placebo treatment. The darker color received treatment with ARC-31. And this is day one where the mice are performing uh, similarly on, on this task. But by day nine, you can see that the placebo-treated mice were not performing significantly better, but the, the uh, ARC-31-treated mice were performing much better. They were finding the platform in 40 seconds compared to 65 seconds. So this suggests that ARC-31 is having an effect on the memory and learning of the head-injured mice. Another test that we use in our traumatic brain injury studies looks at motor skills, looks at the ability of the mice to stay on a rotating drum. Very simple, very simple task. The drum just rotates and the mouse has to stay on. And of course, you can imagine if the mouse is having any difficulty with its motor function, it's going to fall off more readily. What we're looking at here is after injury. So we actually tested the mice before injury. And so everything here is plotted as a function of their pre-injury performance. So before injury, this is where the mice should have been. So the first day after injury, both groups are not significantly different. The lower group here, the pink, are the mice that received placebo. The blue is the mice that received ARC-31. And you can see that in the mice that received placebo, they did improve over time, but by day seven, they still have not recovered the 100% line, they're still not as good as they were before injury. Whereas the mice that received treatment with ARC-31, they got there by day five and they continue to improve. So again, these are pilot data. There's a lot more work to do, but these are very encouraging. This suggests to us that this drug, which may not be a million miles from being able to move forward within the clinic, this drug may be useful for treatment of traumatic brain injury. I'd like to just mention some of the other studies that are ongoing before, before I hand over to Mike. We have, of course, given the nature of this work, we have a lot of collaborations with the VA and with the Army, and this work is funded by the Department of Defense and by the Veterans Administration. One study um, is for us to recruit folks at the Tampa VA who have sustained a head injury, and so we are recruiting individuals who are inpatients at the VA and also will be recruiting outpatients at the VA clinic. We are looking to recruit as many individuals as possible. We don't care where you're coming from. We would like to recruit you into our studies. How you can help is by giving us your history. If you have a history of exposure, if you're a, a Gulf War uh, 1991, we would like that information about potential exposures, where you were deployed, any information that you can give us. But what we want to do is take blood samples and we will look in your blood samples 
and we will map that back against what we see in our mouse models. And as we recruit enough people, we will start to be able to pull out patterns. We will start to be able to see that in individuals suffering from PTSD, that we see particular, uh, particular molecules present in the blood compared with individuals who do not have PTSD. As you can imagine, we're going to need a lot of people to make that happen. Nobody's actually doing this. It is amazing to me. They've just begun a study, uh, the Million Veterans Study, to start to look at some genetic aspects in the veterans population. But, you know, we can't wait that long. I've been going out there and talking to the folks at the Tampa VA, the Boston VA, the Bronx VA. I will talk to whoever is interested in collaborating. I want to be a bit of a vampire about this. I want your blood. I want to get the blood samples in here for us to analyze. And I am very confident with the technology that we have now that if we get enough people participating, we will start to see signals. Because if we get enough people, just, just to be clear about what it is I'm, I'm uh, facing here, we will need to be able to group people by age group, by ethnicity, by gender, by exposure, by how long they were out there in the field, by the numbers of deployments. Every time we make a cut like that, it reduces the number in each group. So we need to recruit a lot of people. That's for the studies translating from the mice to the humans. The other studies that we have ongoing is where we are recruiting our active military pre and post deployment. I have collaborative research with the aeronautical lab in, uh, in Alabama. And at this point, we have recruited 470 troops, blood samples from them before they were deployed. And we will be getting blood samples from them when they come back, please God, all of them. And we will be matching those blood profiles against their neuropsychological profiles. They're getting a full neuropsychometric workup. So we will be able to look at the individuals who came back with a traumatic brain injury, who developed depression, who developed PTSD. And in that situation, we've got a baseline measurement for them. We, we know what their blood looked like before they went away. And we'll be able to compare them against their own sample. I'm very excited by that study. And again, I'm looking to expand that. So, um, other models we're developing. We have developed repetitive injury models. Again, stepping away a moment from the military situation. Civilians have finally realized that all these hits on the head that the NFL players get is not good. It is now a big deal. People are recognizing that repetitive, mild traumatic brain injury is very debilitating. And so we have models to explore that as well. So I think I'm, I think I'm gonna wrap up now because um, I've talked way too long and there's a lot more to see and there's a lot more to hear. But I hope that that's given you a bit of a snapshot and I hope that you'll see why I'm, I'm seeing the Alzheimer program as a roadmap for us. It's taken, it took 20 years for us to go from identifying a cause in Alzheimer's disease to getting drugs into the clinic. So our crew here at the Institute, we've now been down this path of drug discovery. All the molecular biology and chemistry and pathology, we have all of that expertise now. We also have technology that we did not have 20 years ago. 10 years ago, five years ago, we've got really advanced technology now. So I'm very confident that we're going to be able to make great strides in this in the future. So good morning and thank you for visiting us today. We really appreciate it. And as Fiona has told you um, about her research, it's not just nationally known, they're really world-class people. Um, now my task as a clinician, I'm a neurologist, um, I'd like to share with you what we can do while we wait for her drugs, okay? <laughs> and believe me, they work much quicker than most places. Now, we'd, we'd like to keep our brains as fit and healthy as we possibly can while we're waiting for drugs, um, should we need them. Hopefully, we will not need drugs. And this is a spectrum I've put up here, and you can see on your right side, somewhere in the spectrum is normal, towards the, the end of the right side. Uh, where do you think you lie on the spectrum? Do you think you in the reddish area? Um, the kind of symptoms you may have are slowing of, of movements, um, slowing of thought, slowing of action, problems with thinking, problems with memory. Of course, it all started many, many millions of years ago. 
at some stage we were forced down from the trees and we had to become bipedal. And then we had slowly developed bigger brains and then we developed tool making and therefrom came language and culture and then we had a number of revolutions such as the agricultural and science and industrial revolutions. And this all happened very quickly in the span of maybe two to three million years. However, our heritage, our body makeup, our cells, our brains date back far further than that. So if you want to try and understand how you should live today, you really have to think about living more like a caveman. And we'll get into that. Or cavewoman. And just to make the point, and this is a very good book if any, any of you would like to read it. Have you read it? Did you like it? Yeah. It's a very interesting book and there's, there's several good books about this. There was a stage some 40, 50,000 years ago when we were way healthier than we are now. We were much taller, we had bigger brains, our body physique was magnificent apparently. Um, and that's probably because at that time we still ate the right foods. And that's when we were Cro-Magnon men. And there's some very interesting examples of skeletons that they were digging up on the North American continent that, um, that are up to 9, 10 and 11 feet tall. American, the original American Indians. They were tall people, very, very physically powerful. In fact, there's a story uh, from Francis Drake and uh, De Soto, the early explorers. One of them got shipwrecked in, in the Bay of California and had to replace the mask of his boat. And three of his strongest soldiers couldn't lift the mast. An American Indian came along and with one arm picked up the mast and planted on his boat. And this is a, in the original Chronicles, if you want to read about it. So we were at some stage much healthier than we are today. Now, going back to the spectrum, the so-called normal is near the right side. As we start aging, in fact, when we start having risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, we already have impaired brains, even if we haven't damaged our brains yet. But at the microscopic molecular level, there's already effects going on. And if you go back to the left side, you can obviously develop strokes. These are pictures of strokes. Um, and that's a PET brain scan on the extreme left, which is a metabolic scan of your brain, which picks up things much more accurately than you could with a structural scan. And if any of you are having trouble with my accent, I promise you the third speaker is American. <laughs> Even if you have never had a stroke but you have risk factors, if we do very intensive cognitive testing on you, we'll find some deficits. And then of course you could say to yourself, well, could you be even fitter than normal? And the answer is yes. If you do a lot of, uh, of the right things like exercise intensively and eat the right brain foods and challenge your brain continuously, you will have a very fit brain, a cognitively fit brain, much like a marathon runner is able to run 26 miles or 50 miles, and that's more than most of us do. And just to make the point from a very big and well-conducted study, if you exercise properly, you will dramatically reduce your risk of aging and dementia. And you can see from these graphs that you can reduce that by up to 50% or more. Now, if this was a drug, we'd all be very happy, but this is just physical exercise alone. And there's your reference, um, the Movies Project. And the, what they determine high exercise level is not that high. 30 minutes is not that much. There's a lot of evidence from other medical studies that the right amount is more in the region of one hour. But even if you exercise 15 to 20 minutes, it's beneficial. So keep in mind this exercise story. There's a lot more to brain fitness and cognitive health than just exercise. Just to um, introduce some other concepts is cognitive exercises. In other words, um, brain training exercises. Sleeping properly. You know, we are designed to sleep eight hours a day. We spend one third of our lives asleep. Can you believe that? It's got to have an important function. You have to look after that function. Socialization is important. It reduces your risk of getting even viral infections and cancers and vascular disease. Neurogenesis in the brain happens. There's at least three sites that have been identified where we grow new brain cells in response to things like physical exercise. And obviously we'd like to know 
how much of this occurs, can we improve upon it, and so forth. How does it do this? Um, it improves learning and memory. It even alleviates depression, and there are some studies even to show us that it does better than drugs, it does better than things like Prozac. It improves executive function, things like multitasking. And there's a number of um, mechanisms at the molecular level whereby this occurs. There's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, for example, another one called IGF-1 that increases. It increases the connections, the blood vessels, the number of brain cells. So not only does exercise improve our brain function at a molecular level, it also helps us with weight maintenance. And this is where that, there's a very big woman study that was published just two years ago, whereby they found that if you exercise as a woman one hour a day, you will maintain your weight. If you start doing less than that, you may be one of those that increase with, uh, have a problem with weight gain. You improve your cognition, you reduce your risk of dementia, and most important, we improve what we can call our brain padding, or cognitive reserve. So we'd all like to have a reservoir of brain function that if we do get hit by something, like a stroke, we'd like to overcome it very easily or not even know that we've had a stroke. And silent strokes certainly occur. So some of the figures that uh, are a more modern version of the American Heart Association guidelines which say 30 minutes is fine, um, it's more like an hour. And most people in an hour could maybe run six miles kayak six miles, swim one, one point something miles, cycle 20, walk four. This is the kind of intensity we should keep in mind. Now obviously if you have some kind of deficit that you cannot achieve this amount, there's many other ways of doing it. For example, pool therapy. If you cannot exercise for an hour, half an hour is also good. Even 15 minutes is better than nothing. There's also what we call cognitive exercises and just reading alone is regarded as mental gymnastics. If you do a lot of reading, it really lights up the entire brain. If you look at a functional MRI scan where we can see activity in the brain of somebody reading, a lot of the brain actually light, lights up on the scan when we read. And you form associations. There's, there's a tremendous amount of research into just how valuable reading alone is. There's many other brain activities. I used to give my patients these games, Brain Age 1, Brain Age 2. They're very fun Nintendo type of games that give you a score of how well you're doing. But you know, things have moved on from there today. Even though I don't possess an iPhone, I will soon. There are now over 600 million iPhone applications and there's many fun games on, on iPhone apps. One of them that I came across recently is um, Words with Friends. The, these are all very, very clever games, and the point about them is not only do they evolve all the time, but it's much cheaper. If you already have an iPhone, you don't need to buy a Nintendo for $100. So things are moving very quickly. There's also web-based games that you could use. Now, I mentioned something about sleep. Sleep is not only important for restorative function, just that you feel right the next day. But if you don't sleep properly, you're prone to depression, you have no energy levels, you cannot concentrate, you cannot remember properly. I um, mean, you're also putting yourself at risk of stroke and heart attack and a number of other illnesses. Um, those people who are particularly badly affected, for example, by sleep apnea and snoring, this dramatically impairs your brain function. And this can be treated, yes, with uh, CPAP in the short term, but the long-term measure is to reduce the factors that led to the snoring in the first place. Even napping in the afternoon is extremely beneficial. They are called power naps by some people. And there's a big study from Greece that was published just uh, one or two years ago that if you have a regular nap in the afternoon, you reduce your chance of a cardiac event, in other words, a heart attack, by 37%. Now these are huge numbers just from napping in the afternoon. And of course the Latin people call this a siesta. There's a tremendous amount of research about brain foods and it's a big topic on its own, but just as a quick summary, 
fruit and vegetables are extremely important for everybody. They have a huge number of antioxidants in them. Uh, some fruits are more potent than others, we know that. And even cocoa, tea, coffee and chocolate. For example, chocolate just in the last week was shown to reduce stroke by 20%. You have to be careful of what kind of chocolate. It's got to have at least 30% cocoa, fat content mustn't be too high, etc. Uh, fish and red meats and white meats very important in your diet. Meats are brain foods for us. That's, that's what we did when we jumped down from the trees. It allowed our, our brains to enlarge in the first place. Even alcohol is good for you for a number of reasons. Um, and of course uh, any kind of sodas or soft drinks are extremely unhealthy for you even if they are diet. And there's a whole literature to that that some, in some instances, even with diet sodas, your stroke risk is up 60%. Fish consumption is important for us. This is a, a huge a worldwide study that was published in, over 10 years ago showing you the very, very strong relationship between fish consumption and depression. In those countries that eat a lot of fish, like Jap Japan and Eastern Asian countries, depression is low. In the meat and potato diet that we tend to have in the, we in the West, uh, depression much higher. We're finding new components and, and things like dark beer called xanthohumol, which is one of the most potent anti-cancer agents that we've ever found. Now, and what amounts it is in dark beer, we're not certain, but that's why the Irish drink Guinness. Yes. See? And then at the same time, everything's a double-edged sword. Um, in the last 20, 30 years, food companies have piled extra sugar, extra salt, extra fat into just about everything, and our brains are addictive to these. They're addicted to these compounds, so you will eat more and more without even knowing it, and that's how, why we get fat. And here's a list of the kind of addictive properties that various things have, like alcohol, cocaine, heroin, uh, even pain tablets, analgesics. And I put hyperpalatable foods right at the bottom. We don't exactly know how addictive they are, but we think very addictive. Anybody who wants to read more about this, this is the book by Kessler on the right, The End of Overeating. Very well worth reading. It kind of explains to us what happened over the last 20, 30 years, why we became a fat nation. And it's not just this country, it's the whole of the West. There's a massive amount of evidence accruing all the time that the Mediterranean diet will reduce dementia, heart attack, stroke, and a number of other things like cancer. This is the Mediterranean food pyramid. Basically what it says, eat red meat, white meat, cut away the fat, eat fish, fruit, vegetables, nuts. And there's one difference. Mediterranean diet says you can have a lot of grain. Other diets like the paleo diet say go slow on the grain because our bodies still don't know what it is. We've only been eating it for 10,000 years. That's nothing. And, and our evolutionary spectrum. And a worldwide study for heart attack, for example, showed us that a prudent diet, in other words, a diet with lots of fruit and vegetables, again, dramatically reduced the amount of heart attacks, no matter what culture you looked at. 30% is a big number. At the same time, we begin to understand that Alzheimer's disease is a vascular disease. Alzheimer's disease is a kind of stroke syndrome, you could say, because most people with Alzheimer's dementia have a vascular component, somewhere in the region of 80 to 90 percent. So in a, in a way this is good news for us as, as clinicians because now we can treat two things, the dementia side, the neuronal damage, as, as well as the vascular side. So more treatment options. I mentioned to you that if you're a social animal, our brains are designed to be social. There's evidence from epidemiological studies that that reduces even colds and flus, as well as stroke. So I've been very quickly through a number of these components. There's a lot of things we can do while we wait for Dr. Crawford's drugs, even though she delivers them very quickly, more quickly than most places. We should implement all these factors today for all of us. At the same time, we really need to be cognizant of some of the things we're doing wrong in society. You know, personally, I would not even like to have a minor concussion myself. Even one is bad news. Having more than one is, is not good news at all. And this has been popularized recently. 
Um, this is the Time magazine from 18 months ago. And this is the good news side just from about six months ago. You know, how, how you can boost your brain performance. Um, something along the lines of what I just mentioned. And my final slide is think about how we can improve our brain padding. Because there's a famous story you can all look up on the internet if you want to. It was published in a magazine called Science about six, seven years ago. Richard Wetherill was a famous New York professor of mathematics who loved chess and he could think eight chess moves ahead. And one day he came home and told his wife, I can only think five moves ahead. And she, she said, you're nuts, you're fine. And his neurologist also told him, you're fine, because they did multiple tests on him, including brain scan, they found nothing wrong with him. Now, he happened to die 18 months later, and his brain showed end-stage Alzheimer's disease. He was a good example of what maximal cognitive reserve is like. And that's the way we would all like to go, to be at a high level and then just do this. And that's what cognitive reserve or brain padding is all about. Is it achievable? Absolutely. So there's a lot we can do. I have, I have a kind of a good news lecture for you. There's a lot we can do today about our brain health, never mind the rest of our body health. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Keegan. I'm the Associate Director of the Ross Camp Clinic. Um, I'm, I'm a neurologist. I'm a general neurologist. I work with Dr. Hoffman. He's another neurologist in our group, as well as uh, Dr. Burke. Um, so we make up the physicians at the Ross Camp Clinic. Um, and then we have multiple support staff. Julie is in the back, and Jan, and Terry. And there's some more people currently uh, working with patients right now. So as a neurologist, um, I, I actually saw Ross Camp maybe six years ago. I saw Dr. Mullen give a talk. And he uh, talked about this place that was doing all this research. And I was a kind of a, I, I like academics, but I also like seeing patients. So I was very excited about this place. And you can see why, how the combination of kind of bench science research is kind of coming to the bedside. And that, that takes a long time. That whole process takes a long time. But this place is much more efficient in trying to do that. Um, so it, it makes it much more exciting as me as a clinician seeing patients. It also, I think, is also much more exciting for the patient. When, when a patient comes in here to be seen for Alzheimer's dementia and, and their spouse has questions about what type of research is going on, we can discuss that. And so we kind of give them some information, but they can also contribute and come back and give us help, such as they can provide blood or be part of a research trial. So that that's kind of what separates this clinic from other clinics. Like where I used to practice, I was kind of a, with a small group and we would see patients. We would do, give benefit to the patients and we would have um, a lot of discussions about diagnoses and some of the things like Dr. Hoffman's discussing what things we can do and work on um, over the next couple months and years through the office, but here they're able to think about that behind the wall, there's all this research going on that they may be part of. So it kind of sets it apart in the in the clinical practice. Um, I have a, pra a, a small photo here. This kind of gets back to what um, Dr. Hoffman was discussing. These are two rhesus monkeys, and they're both 27 years old. But the one on the left, this is kind of a, a facial view and a side view compared to the one on the right, there's a difference in the diet that they were given. One was kind of a little more restricted and one was a, a little more eat what you want. So over just 20 years with those animals having a specific diet, you can see just by the way they look, they look a lot better and healthier, the one on the right. Also on the flip side, looking at Biologically, there was higher incidence of diabetes, um, hypertension, as well as they passed away. Um, more of them had passed away by that age. So you can see uh, lifestyle, exercise, diet, sleep, as Dr. Hoffman was discussing, we can do this now, and this does make a difference. And there's good research that shows that. But meanwhile, we're, you know, Dr. Crawford and the group are back in the lab coming up with things mechanistically that will hopefully even do more in the future. Um, and so I think of, that's how I think of Roskamp working from bench um, to bedside, 
that we work um, in the basic science, we have the labs, but we also do what I consider translational research, the biomarker research, kind of what Dr. Crawford was discussing. So um, recently we were starting to look even at Parkinson's disease. It's another neurodegenerative disease. We're not talking about amyloid, although amyloid may also be part of it. We're talking about something called alpha-synuclein. So the models that they've generated here can also translate into other disease processes where there's some accumulation of something bad that's then causing inflammation in the brain that some of the mechanisms that we're studying could also apply to these other diseases and potentially some of the medicines that are targets that are being developed can also apply. Um, and then we move forward into kind of uh, the actual drug testing. We work with pharmaceutical companies such as like Pfizer, they may have a a medication that they want to test for Alzheimer's disease, they'll pick maybe 100 sites across the country, collect 10 patients per site, and then we may be one of the sites collecting that data. In fact, we have somebody currently getting an infusion for one of the trials that we're doing. So th this type of research is, that's considered phase three research in pharmaceutical industry. The phase one studies, kind of what uh, Dr. Crawford was talking about with something like novatapine, if something was brought to the United States, they may want to have that phase one study where you're looking at safety study in humans and then moving into the translation of seeing if it works in a, in a disease process like Alzheimer's. Um, and then kind of on the nutraceutical side, um, it, she was alluding to uh, one, of, one of the compounds we're looking at, it comes in tobacco, but you can actually look at things that are food supplements given at maybe higher amounts and you can do that in a, in a, quicker, uh, in a quicker method as opposed to going through all the steps that you have to do, but you can still uh, test out safety and see if this is efficacious in other diseases such as Alzheimer's. Um, and then, of course, in the clinic, we do clinical practice. We see patients. We see patients with their standard neurologic diseases, mild cognitive impairment. There's definitely an interest in people concerned with their memory. Uh, Jan and Julie are part of what we do, early memory screen. If someone's in their 60s, they want to have kind of a benchmark of their memory and thinking, we can have them come in, have a baseline memory test, and then they can come back a year later or a couple of years later if they're feeling there's some change. We look at that test, we send out a letter if it's normal or if we think you need more uh, testing. We don't make a diagnosis, but we just kind of, that acts as a screen to get a baseline. Um, and then I mentioned Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, also brain injury, concussion. I, I do have some veterans in the practice, both with Alzheimer's as well as brain injury, and uh, kind of managing that, and Dr. Hoffman also works with brain injury. So those are the main disease processes we, we focus on. And then these are our doctors. Dr. Burke, who's not here, she's from uh, University of South Florida. She's also specializes in Parkinson's disease. And then the, the free memory screen I mentioned, that's, um, Again, you're only here for maybe 30 minutes or so. Uh, the actual testing is probably shorter. Um, and I, I, got, I kind of emphasize you get a baseline, but you can even come back at a year, two years later to, to repeat it and check it again. And then the clinical trials I kind of went through, this is where we, we talk about we have study in Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and then the uh, nutraceutical that we're working with. Um, Someone up front, I think, had asked earlier about trials or research in that's more kind of maybe behavioral in that area. There was a grant awarded, I believe, to the Sarasota uh, Memory Disorders Clinic where they have a really, it's, it's kind of a looking at support group, applying a supportive system to people who have Alzheimer's disease and their spouses. And it's really quite nice as a physician. I can send the, the spouse and family there, and they're trying to see if this kind of support group or support system is helpful. So there are clinical trials that are more um, kind of on the behavioral end that you know, they're trying to see if there's uh, any benefit. Um, and then the, the work that Dr. Hoffman was discussing, there's plenty of trials showing the benefit in those areas of eating, exercising, and um, getting good sleep. There's good research on that. 